Welcome back. At the end of part one, we were talking about the great vessels that attach to the heart. Uh, what we're going to talk about next are the different chambers of the heart. Um, in this picture, uh, we are looking at a coronal section of the heart, which means that we've taken the heart and we've cut it uh, so to separate the front from the back, and then we've removed the front so that now we're looking at the back wall. So that's what we're looking at in this picture. The right atrium is uh, going to receive deoxygenated blood from the superior and the inferior vena cavae. And the left atrium is going to receive oxygenated blood from the left and the right pulmonary veins. The two atria are separated from each other by um, a strip of uh, myocardial cells, which is called the interatrial septum. And we'll talk more about that um, in the next lecture. Whoops. Our ventricles are going to receive blood from the atria, and they are going to pump the blood to different areas of the body. The right ventricle will uh, receive blood, deoxygenated blood, from the right atrium. And then when the right ventricle contracts, it's going to push the blood into this blood vessel that we have here. This is the pulmonary trunk, and then the pulmonary trunk divides into the left pulmonary vein, uh, I'm sorry, the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery. Um, when the right ventricle contracts, it's going to push open this little valve that we have here, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. The left ventricle is going to receive oxygenated blood from the left atrium. And when the left ventricle contracts, it's going to push blood through a similar valve uh, in the pulmonary trunk. Uh, you just can't see it because my green line is blocking that view here. But when the left ventricle contracts, it pushes the valve open and then oxygenated blood is going to run through the aorta and then out to the rest of the body. The two uh, ventricles are divided by the interventricular septum, a wall um, made of myocardium. All right, looking back at the superficial um, landmarks that are on the heart, the first one to know is the coronary sulcus. The coronary sulcus will divide the atria, the right atrium from the right ventricle when you're looking at the anterior aspect of the heart. And the uh, anterior interventricular sulcus is going to divide the right ventricle from the left ventricle uh, as it runs down the front aspect of the heart. And when I flip the heart over so that we're looking at the back side, now this is something that you need to remember. When you're looking at the posterior aspect of the heart, it's, all, it's just as if you were looking at someone who's turned their back on you. So now when they're facing in the same direction as you are, their left is your left and their right is your right. So when we're looking at the posterior aspect of the heart, the left side is, uh, is over here. So I'll just put a little L here for, whoops, uh, for left. If I can get this going, here we go. So this is the left side. And then on this side, we have the, the right side of the heart. So anyway, the posterior interventricular sulcus is on the back side of the heart, um, and it too is going to divide the left ventricle from the right ventricle. So even if you're looking at the surface of the heart without having to cut it open, you should be able to use these landmarks in order to tell which side is left and which side is right. Okay, looking back uh, on the uh, at some of the interior features of the heart, I wanted to talk about the valves. The first valves uh, include the AV valves, which stands for atrioventricular valves, and their name tells you exactly where they're located. They're located between the atria and the ventricles, which are below. The right AV valve has a second name called the tricuspid valve because it's made of three tri three flaps or cusps that create the valve. Now, these flaps are made up of the tough endocardium, which uh, makes that slippery lining inside of all of the chambers. Um, but the AV valves have um, another uh, structural feature that's interesting. You'll notice that they have these cords that are attached to these muscles that uh, anchor the, um, the valve to the walls of the ventricles. These cords have a special name. They're called the cordy tendony, 
and these muscles are called the papillary muscles. The papillary muscles in the cordy tendony are going to prevent the valve from um, protruding into the right atrium when the right ventricle contracts. And by preventing that, they are also preventing the backflow of blood. We only want blood to run in one direction in the heart, from the atria to the ventricles and then out through the great vessels, and that's it. We don't want blood seeping from the ventricles back into the atria. The left AV valve, which I have um, over on the left-hand side of my heart here, is also known as the bicuspid valve. So it's made up of two cusps. That's where the prefix bi comes in. Uh, it's got a similar structure to the tricuspid valve. But guess what? The left AV valve has a third name. It is also known as the mitral valve. This is a picture of the valves, uh, of one of the uh, AV valves. Um, up here at the top, this is where the flap is of endocardium that makes up the actual valve proper. Uh, these are the cordy tendony, and then this is the papillary muscle that it's attached to. We have two other valves to know inside of the heart. The structure of these valves makes them semilunar valves, because if you look, they look like, well, I mean, I don't know, they look like uh, crescent moons to me, but they're calling them semi-lunar valves, so I guess it means like half moon valves. So that's what we're looking at here. Um, we have one that will divide the right ventricle from the pulmonary trunk. This is called the pulmonary valve, which is a semi-lunar valve. And then right over here, kind of hiding uh, back here in the back, this is the aortic valve, which is also a semilunar valve, and that is going to divide the left ventricle from the opening to the aorta. So the aorta is kind of passing behind this pulmonary trunk here, just so that you have uh, some orientation as to what's going on with that great vessel. So what basically happens is that when the ventricle contracts, and I'll just talk about the right ventricle here since it's right in front, when the right ventricle contracts, it's going to push blood from the right ventricle and it's going to push on these two cusps, forcing them open. So when the blood comes through here, those cusps are going to open like so. Uh, and then once the ventricle relaxes and the pressure inside of this chamber drops, um, the, any blood that's left inside of this vessel is going to be pulled by gravity backward towards the right ventricle. But like I said, we don't want any backflow of blood. We want unidirectional flow of blood through the heart and the great vessels. So what happens is that when the blood comes back down through this vessel, it's going to be caught in the little cup of this valve, forcing it closed. And that's how the valve is going to prevent flow of blood from the pulmonary trunk back into the right ventricle. The same is true of this little um, semilunar valve that is found between the left ventricle and the aorta. So uh, um, again, when the left ventricle contracts, it, it pushes the valve open. When the ventricle relaxes, any blood that's inside of the aorta is going to fill those little cups and force them closed. And that's a, a really important process, which I'll get to in, in just a second. What we're looking at here is a top view of the heart, but the atria and the great vessels have been removed. So we're looking down into the right ventricle uh, right here, and we're looking down into the left ventricle on this side. Uh, this is the aortic semilunar valve, and this is the pulmonary semilunar valve. So what you can see in this picture is uh, the differences in structure of all of these valves. So the right atrioventricular valve is called the tricuspid valve because it's made up of three flaps, one, two, and three. And on the left-hand side, we have the bicuspid valve, which is made up of two flaps, one and two. And then you can see the difference between our AV valve structure and our semilunar valve structure. So the semilunar valves are made up of three different sections. And, and again, they're, they're kind of like three different cups. So they have this indentation that's in the middle so that when blood flows back down, it's going to force those cups to close. And, uh, 
and, and that's how it's going to prevent any backflow uh, from the great vessels into the ventricles themselves. But the aortic valve has a special feature, and that's these two little holes right here. These are the openings to the coronary arteries. Um, and so when um, this valve is forced closed by blood that's coming back backwards through the aorta, uh, blood is going to fill these two little cups, and it's going to be able to flow out into the coronary arteries. And uh, we'll talk about those in just a moment. All right, so let's take a look at how blood flows through the heart. Um, and so as the little rectangles on the slide show up, if you follow along with the picture, you'll see yellow numbers. As I change the slide, the yellow numbers are gonna turn orange, which is just showing you that, okay, we talked about those steps already. Focus, you know, each slide um, on uh, the yellow numbers. So number one, we get return of deoxygenated blood from the body through the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. And all of that deoxygenated blood is going to enter into the right atrium. The right atrium is going to contract and push the blood through the right AV valve and the blood goes into the right ventricle. The right ventricle is going will contract then and uh, that's going to force blood through the pulmonary valve and into the pulmonary trunk, which then divides into the right and left pulmonary arteries. The right and left pulmonary arteries are going to take blood away from the heart, so remember artery away, and take this blood to the lungs where gas exchange occurs. So carbon dioxide is going to be dropped off and oxygen is going to be picked up. The blood then, newly oxygenated, is going to return to the heart through the right and left pulmonary veins and it's going to enter right here into the left atrium. From the left atrium, it moves into the left ventricle by passing through the left AV valve. And then when the ventricle contracts, it's going to force the blood through this aortic valve, which is actually right here, and into the aorta itself. The blood is going to flow through the ascending aorta, through the, a through the aortic arch, and then through the descending aorta and out to the body, um, at least out to the lower extremities and the abdomen. So as you can see, the aorta kind of arches above our pulmonary trunk here, and then it's going to descend behind the heart and into the abdomen. But what about the upper extremities and the head? Well, that's what the branches are on top of the aorta. That's what those are for. So the one that is um, on the right-hand side, that's going to serve the right side of the head and the right arm. The one in the middle serves the left side of the head, and the one all the way to the left serves the left arm. So, uh, as I said, the blood in the aorta is going to be distributed throughout the body, and then once gas exchange has occurred in the tissues, um, the deoxygenated blood returns to the heart through the inferior and the superior vena cavae, and that is how blood flows through the heart. Now, uh, the heart has its own circulatory system. So blood that is actually found inside of the chambers that is being pushed throughout the body, uh, the um, heart cells, the, the myocardial cells cannot use that. Uh, they can only use blood that, it, that reaches them through the right and left coronary arteries. And so I'm going to stop the video here uh, and we'll talk about um, the coronary arteries and the heart circulatory system in part three.